I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do not care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. On the Illuminati's calendar, the highest, the most sacred of all nights of human sacrifice is that of Samhain. Now the nights of Samhain are observed from October 29th through the 31st. Um, October 29th is the first day of Samhain, and the second, third, um, second day of um, Samhain and it wraps up on what you would call Halloween, the third night of Samhain. Now Samhain is the Celtic Lord of the Dead. He is depicted as um, a stag god. He always has been depicted as a stag god. Um, this is just um, how they practice in the occult. Now, this is one of the very few remaining um, reliefs of the stag god that is still out in the open for anyone to see. Um, this is, of course, this one is in the British Isles. And this one in particular, this would be the stag god, but he's also known as Kernanos. Okay, that's the Celt one of the Celtic names for Samhain. Now, one of the statues of Samhain is, as I said, depicted as a stag god. You notice the antlers and everything. Now, the stag god of the occult world, as has already been pointed out, is nothing else but Nimrod. Nimrod um, was eventually depicted as a god that had one horn like Moloch. Some depicted him as having um, antlers like um, this stag here. This is just one of those ancient representations of the stag god. Now, during the Knights of Samhain, and the Knights of Samhain came about because of an ancient um, nomadic people known as the Celts. Now the Celtic people um, came into the British Isles and throughout Ireland, Scotland, that entire region around 900 BC and basically held all sway and authority in those regions till up and around 900 AD. So almost 2,000 years there they were in control of that region of the world. Now the Celtic people these warrior nomadic people had a priestly class like just any other major culture you can think of. Their priestly class was known as the Druids. Now from the Gaelic, Druid means men of oak. This is why the oak tree is still the most sacred tree in the Illuminati world. And it is the same oak that you will find the Illuminati owl at the Bohemian Grove is made out of. That is a 40-foot oak Illuminati owl. Now, the Druids literally held all sway and authority in the Celtic tribe. Because they were priests, they were um, exempt from um, going to war. But part of their duties of um, being a priest was they were supposed to read the entrails of animals and tell you if it was a good time to go to war or if it was a bad time to go to war. They also had um, the authority to tell people when they could get married and who could get married. They could um, tell you if a person was and should be allowed to hold some type of officer or some type of authoritarian position within the tribe. They could tell you who could and who could not be allowed to worship at their temples. Now, one of the most ancient of temples that still in existence today is that of Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a megalithic stone circle. It was at places like these that the Druids would go and worship their um, stag god. Now this, this happened eight times a year on the major Sabbaths and the minor ones. Stonehenge is difficult to date, um, the archaeologists, as far as, as far as they understand right now, it probably dates back to somewhere around 3000 BC and was built in three consecutive building orders. You know, first it was a smaller part, then they built it out, and they built it out again. Now, Stonehenge is made out of a rare blue granite material that can only be found 
um, I think it's about 70 something miles away in Scotland. And the problem is, how did they get something that weighed over four tons, some of even up to 10 tons, I believe, how did they move something that heavy, all that distance, over the river and over the grounds to where it resides now? Now, of course, there's various myths and legends, you know, my country, one in particular that says um, the most powerful wizard in history, Merlin, actually summoned, you know, those great megalithic stones and, you know, made Stonehenge. Well, it's a fanciful tale, but that's all it is. The one interesting thing about Stonehenge, aside from the fact that it's not just a temple complex, it's also an astrological observatory, and it's also the place where the Druids practice the rites of human sacrifice eight times a year. Archaeologists have already unearthed underneath Stonehenge more than 4,000 human skeletal remains. Now Stonehenge, believe it or not, is a small stone circle. There were literally, there, um, you know, there were hundreds throughout that region and one of the biggest ones and part of it still exists today for people to look at is the one in Avesbury. The one in Avesbury is more than a mile in circumference. Now if Stonehenge is a small one, you can only imagine how many bodies, human sacrifices, the m remains must be under Avesbury. But anyways, on the night of Samhain, Druids would gather at um, Stonehenge and they had previously um, taken um, gourds or um, turnips, in America we use pumpkins, and hollowed them out and they would fill them up with human fat. This fat had been gathered from previous human sacrifice offerings to the various pagan gods of the Druids. Now, they would take um, these items, set them aside, then they would take out these huge cauldrons and put them over a fire pit and they would light them. And these cauldrons were fit were filled with an apple-like um, substance, you know, almost like apple juice, so a mead is really the closest thing um, to it. And they would light those fires, and then they would take these turnips, these gourds, in America we use pumpkins, and they would go wandering out throughout the countryside to various homes of nobility, such as dukes, marquees, to, um, they'd visit this castle, this manor, and they would literally walk up to these doors and bang on them and scream out trick or treat. For those inside the home, this literally sent a wave of absolute terror throughout their bodies because if the Lord of the Manor cooperated with the Druids and gave them a treat, they would take one of their own household servants and if they had no servants, they would use one of their own household members, one of their families, and give them over to those Druid priests so that they could be used as a human sacrifice offering that night. Now, as a reward for the um, treat, the um, Druids um, would leave one of those pumpkins that had been previously filled with fat on the front door and light it. This was supposed to protect everyone inside of that house, that mansion, that manor, from all the demonic forces that they would be summoning up during the Nights of Samhain. Now here's the trick. If you did not cooperate with the Druids and give someone over for a human sacrifice offering, they would paint a six-pointed star in blood with a circle around it on the door. This is the foulest, most evil of all symbols in the occult world. There's nothing that can even come close. You need this symbol to literally call up a demon into this plane of existence. This is known as a hexagram. It's a six-pointed star with a circle around it. Usually that night, someone would be driven um, to, to their death from fear of everything that would be summoning up. They would be 
being attacked by demons, having these visions and everything, they would literally be driven to their own death through fear. Now, after many hours of wandering about through the countrysides, the Druids would come back to places such as Stonehenge, and this is where they would um, begin to have their version of fun. They would take um, their um, sacrifices, the soon-to-be human sacrifices, and they would line them up in um, one straight line. Now, do you remember those huge cauldrons we were speaking about? It would be cauldrons such as these, these huge cauldrons that had been previously filled up with um, that apple cider or mead-like substance and the druids would take apples and throw them into these cauldrons. Now I want you to think of something first before I continue. The boiling point of a liquid in this case is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Literally speaking, um, it, it, it could melt the flesh right off of you. And so what the druids would be doing they would be taking apples and throwing it into those cauldron. Then they would take one of those people and bring them up to the cauldron and say, now if you can take those, one of those apples out in between your teeth, on the first try, we will let you go. Now, think about this. How many of you would actually take the opportunity to try to grab one of those apples in between your teeth so that you could leave alive? Well, at first, most people would say, sure, I would do it. But you have to remember also, that cauldron has been boiling away for hours and hours and hours. It has reached the um, boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. It could literally melt the flesh off of you. Now, would you um, dip your head into that cauldron? And most people would say no. However, most of those poor victims back then did it. Because, you see, that would be the only chance that they had of escaping and living. There was no other choice. If they wanted to have a chance to live and go back to their families, they would take it. Of course, the problem would be, once they dipped their heads into that liquid, I mean, oh my goodness, the Medically speaking, from my medical background, I can tell you the damage was horrific, you know. Not just the third degree burns and the scarring alone that would happen afterwards, but the 212 degrees liquid um, going into the ears would give them permanent hearing loss. Into their mouths, they would have respiratory damage for the rest of their days. If any went um, in between the eyelids, they'd end up blind or near blind. I mean, the, the horror of what the druids considered to be a game is reprehensible in the least. But for those who actually grabbed an apple, the druids cut their binds off immediately and sent them home. However, if you did not grab an apple in between your teeth on the first try, they threw you on the ground and beheaded you right there on the spot. And the archaeologists have found many of those remains of those people underneath Stonehenge had indeed been beheaded. Now, before the Druids had set out on their nightly vigils for those three days to um, practice and worship um, during the Nights of Samhain, a week before that event, they had sent the, Catholic, the Celtic warriors throughout the entire regions and had them gather up thousands of wicker reeds. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen wicker used before, such as in, you know, um, wicker furniture or in baskets that was used for um, the little baskets for Easter. Um, some people in the martial arts are using wicker reeds. Wicker is a very durable um, um, substance. It, it, it bends and gives, and it really is something you can work with. Now, <clears throat> after those we reeds would be brought over, the Druids had built these huge human-like effigies. I mean, they were 20, 30 feet tall. And they had cages built in them 
This human effigy was known as the Wicker Man. Now, the Wicker Man, as I said before, resembled that of a human being, and there were various cages running throughout it where they would put animal offerings, some had food offerings, the rest of it were where they put their human sacrifice offerings. They put them inside of the Wicker Man. Then afterwards, they would um, call upon um, their god, one of their um, false gods known as Kunanos. And one thing I, I forgot to mention, if um, they didn't have enough room inside the Wicker Man to put all their human sacrifice offering, they had um, human um, cages made out of Wicker where they could put the rest of it. But what would happen, you know, the Wicker Man would eventually be engulfed in flames. And this is where and what would happen to those people who was offered up as a human sacrifice on the nights of Samhain. This was their eventual fate. And what troubles me, troubles me greatly today, is that in the Nevada desert, since um, the year 2000, an annual event has been going on. It's known as um, the Burning Man. It's still the Wicker Man. What they are doing, ladies and gentlemen, these pagans from across the nation are coming together once a year on particular dates and setting up the old occult practices. One of those practices is that of the Wicker Man. Now, no one, gratefully, has been offered up as a human sacrifice offering, at least not to my knowledge. But um, it's, it really gives me cause for great concern that um, these events are going on. Um, right here, as we're saying, um, this is from the New York Times. This is, um, I believe, September 17th. This is the year 2000 in which the revival of the Burning Man or the Wicker Man has begun. You will notice uh, all it is, it's the same practice, it's just, you know, a different rendition of that human effigy. And yes, it does give me cause for concern. Because among other things, at where these people are gathering, the ancient animal, the totem animal, for Nimrod, the golden cow, has also been reconstructed. This is the same creature that the Israelites had fallen down and worshipped at the bottom of the mountain of Sinai when Moses had vanished, and Aaron was forced to um, um, make a golden cow for the people to worship. During the nights of Samhain, even to this very day, the belief is that the veils that separate the spiritual world from the physical world are at their thinnest. And that they can, um, during these days, these nights, um, departed souls can come and visit their loved ones. Now, this is only done once you like the great bonfires, or what's known as the bale fires. Once these bale fires are lit, they act as a beacon to those departed souls in the spiritual realm for them to focus on. This will allow them to cross over and enter into our world. But the problem here is no one and nothing says that these spirits that are crossing over are going to be benevolent or good spirits. Nothing guarantees that. So what the Druids came up with, um, they first um, would devise these headgear and masks that was absolutely horrifying. You know, they looked like demonic creatures and they painted these symbols and other things on their robes. And all these things were supposed to keep those um, malevolent or bad spirits in check. And of course, you know, we have um, those things nowadays. You know, this is, of course, where the origin of the Halloween costume um, comes into play. 
Halloween is nothing but the recreation of the worship of Samhain, the Celtic Lord of the Dead, on his high and holy days. When we take a look at Halloween for what it is, well, kids are dressed up in these costumes, so are grown-ups. They go out trick-or-treating, don't they? And they demand a sacrifice. They get candy for it. Afterwards, well, they go home, and there will be these huge festivals like the Druids were doing, and they will be playing the same game, except we call it bobbin for apples. Instead of, you know, throwing it into a cauldron that's boiling at 212 degrees, we'll put it into a cauldron or into some other vat or something with cold water and have the people dip their heads in it and get it that way. It's the same thing, though. And so the practice of bobbin for apples still continue on today, except in a much easier format, if you would. But these things are still going on. Some people will say, oh, well, none of this really goes on anymore and that it's harmless and all this. Well, you see, this one photo that I brought is a photo of Stonehenge. Now, what most people don't realize is that this Stonehenge is in um, an area of Washington State known as Mary Hill. This, believe it or not, had been built back in the 1900s, the early past, to honor those people who died during World War I because they fought in Europe. Well, personally speaking, I don't think I would want that as my own memorial because it's nothing but the ancient reconstruction of a site where human sacrifice had been practiced. To this very day, Christians will try to counterfeit Halloween by having what's known as harvest festivals. This is absolutely reprehensible. The, um, all we're doing is just giving it another name because people are still bringing carved jack-o'-lanterns, they're still giving out um, trick-or-treats, candies and other things, they're still playing um, bobbin for apples and I know of many of those places and Christian churches now that are still having um, Christmas, um, excuse me, um, Halloween parties at the churches where people come in in these costumes. I know, I've seen it myself. We have got to make a decision one way or the other, my brothers and sisters. It's time we call it a halt to all this and say either I'm going to serve Jesus Christ all the way and that doesn't mean you're not going to make a mistake or that you're not going to sin. It doesn't mean you end up perfect. But what it does mean is you're going to finally get out there and do something for the Lord or you're just going to stay on this side and do nothing. Remember, the third chapter of the book of Revelation talks about the Laodicean church age where most of the Christians will not be able to use, be, be used of God because they're lukewarm. They are literally fence walking. They will not commit to the left or to the right they are lukewarm. God cannot use them. They are of no good to him. So if you want to be used of God, you want to claim you want God's blessing, you claim you're a child of God, then you better do something while we still can because I guarantee you right now, it is coming close to the end of history. It's coming close to where the Antichrist is going to arrive and that there is indeed going to be great tribulation upon the face of the earth. And it is up to you right now to decide one way or the other. Are you going to choose God one way or the other or are you just going to get out of the way of those who will? Because I tell you right now, history, as I just stated, is coming to a close and it is going to be up to you to make a decision one way or the other. Do you stay on the sand, st um, sidelines or do you as a Christian, a born-again, sold-out servant of God, make a stand?